When I was a young man, very young, I uh, loved to watch cartoons. Uh, my mom and uh, my, my folks were divorced. My mom ended up remarrying a guy. He ended up dying. And so my mom would just say, you know what? Go watch TV. And so I did. And I was very, very, very good at watching cartoons. I love cartoons. Bugs Bunny, favorite. That's, that's just the best. But big fan of Scooby-Doo, Popeye, the Boo Boo and Yogi show, uh, Tom and Jerry. They were, they were all great cartoons. And there was a reoccurring theme that happened in many of them. And that was that there would be something going on and there would be, if you would, an angel on one side and the, the devil on the other side saying, you know, you need to do this. And there, and there was this battle that went on. And that, you see that in shows all the time. It was in The Muppets and Saturday Night Live. And you see this over and over again. There's a a new cartoon movie, which, you know, my kids are older. I don't know which one this is, but I, I saw that one. Uh, Bart's, or uh, Homer Simpson and Spider-Man. And so this is just a common thing. It even made it to the PC versus a Mac commercial. And there was good and evil speaking to Mr. PC. And you know what? In a real way, that happens. There, there's a battle that goes on every day in our lives. You have two voices that are, if you would, on your shoulder. One saying, don't, and by don't, saying, don't do the wrong thing. And then the other one is saying, do the wrong thing. And there is a, a real sense which uh, that goes on all the time, more than you know. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul said in Romans seven twenty one, I, when I want to do good, Evil is right there with me. And, and it, it is a reality that goes on in our lives. This week, you made many choices, and you could have went one way or another. And so this is just a common thing that happens. And this morning, we're going to see how this gets played out in the life of Jonah. We last week started our series on on Jonah, grace for the rebel. And last week, I, I've never studied through the, the book of Jonah. Pastor Jason did an absolutely amazing job, I think, of introducing the book to us. He laid out for us how Jonah was indeed a, a historical figure. This is a, a real biblical account, a true account. Jesus spoke of him as being real. He was a, a prophet of God. He was considered a, a hero. He had given a favorable message, and we saw that in 2 Kings chapter 14. He was a nationalist. He loved his people, Israel. Pastor Jason talked about that the book of Jonah is a, a story of rebellion, of compassion, and of grace. But ultimately, it is a, a book about God. A book about God, and we're going to see that. And we're going to see God and his grace. Now, I want to start this morning by a, a definition, a working definition of grace that you're going to hear throughout this entire series. Because for some people, when you say grace, you say, what does that mean? Well, that's the thing we do before a meal. And, and so I want to give you a definition. Grace is God's goodness to those who deserve only punishment. Grace is God's goodness to those who deserve only punishment. All together, let's say it, grace, God's goodness to those who deserve only punishment. And guess what? God has been gracious to you this week. He has. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Jonah chapter 1. And, and you say, well, how has God been gracious to me? He has been gracious in great many ways. You are here today. You have your health because God has been gracious. If you are here today as a Christian, you understand God's grace in a unique way, that you are a sinner that deserves God's judgment. But you have come to understand Christ's work on the cross, that he died to atone for your sins, to pay the price for your sins. And he offers to those who will believe in his death, his burial, and his resurrection if they will trust him by faith, he, he offers them the gift of eternal life. If they will turn and surrender 
their lives to him. And he removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. And if you're here today, and maybe you have not embraced that message yet, I want you to know that God has and is very gracious to you. He is not treating you today as your sins deserve. Now we come to this passage, and I want us to to read Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. So uh, if you are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we indeed have been the recipients of your grace. You have been good to us, and we truly deserve only punishment. And I pray that you would speak to us through your word today, through the things that Jonah does and the example that he sets. Lord, may you speak to us, may you teach us, and may you change us. And may we see the reality in his life and in our lives as well. So we just commit this time to you and pray that you would work in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, as we go through this passage, I want us to see five things in one great big application. And I do believe, I do believe that this is for all of us. Matter of fact, I know that it is. The first thing we see is how God communicates then and now. It says in Jonah 1.1 that the word of the Lord came to Jonah. This is a common phrase. It happens over a hundred times in, in the Old Testament where God comes and he speaks to people. The word of the Lord comes to somebody. Now God communicated in the Old Testament. Sometimes he would communicate in a vision like he did in, uh, to Abraham in, in Genesis 15. Sometimes he would communicate in a dream like he did to Jacob in Genesis 31. Sometimes he would communicate through different things, as we saw in Exodus chapter 3, where God spoke to Moses through the, uh, through the burning bush. Sometimes God speaks through the, the uh, Urim and Thummim, which is the priests used to carry on their breastplate two sticks or or stone types things, and, and they would kind of cast them, and they would get a yes or no answer when they would inquire from the Lord. Sometimes God spoke to them out of the cloud, out of the, out, out of the, the pillar of fire, but he comes and he speaks to Jonah, and the message is real clear. He says, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. He's saying, Go to them, preach to them, they're evil, and I know it. And he's basically saying, you go to them and you call them to repentance. Now, when I, when I hear that message, I've always thought, wouldn't it be great if the Lord spoke to us that way? I mean, I have never had, I've never had God speak to me audibly. I've never had God say to me, Matt, you are to go to your neighbor. And you are, to, I've just never had that. Now, some of you might have, I don't think that's the way the Lord communicates. But I've often thought, wouldn't it be great if he did? And yet, he didn't do it that frequently in, in the Old Testament. And as I looked at this, in reality, we have it far better. In, in John chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus said, I, am going, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And at Pentecost, God the Holy Spirit came down and he permanently indwells believers. Now, wrap your mind around that. 
If you're here today and you are a Christian, God the Holy Spirit lives within you. That is far better than they had in the Old Testament. He, he dwells within you. He speaks to you. Now, God is, has and always has communicated to the world. We know in, in general revelation, uh, God speaks to all mankind right now, whether you're a believer or not. It says in, in Romans 1.19, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and things that have been made so that they are without excuse. So no matter where you are in this world, you know, people know that there's a God. They may reject him, they may deny him, but in creation, God has revealed himself in a general way. But he has also revealed himself in what is called special revelation. This is concrete information that God has given us and, and is now written down in, in God's word. In Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, it says, Long ago and at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things, and through whom also he created the world. And it goes on to say in, in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is breathed out by God. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And so God does speak. He speaks through his word. And the Holy Spirit, who God who dwells within us, takes the word of God and he communicates to us, to the believer, every day. That, that is why it is absolutely critical that you spend time daily in the Word. Daily. I, I, I would just ask a question. When is the last time that you really, and I'm not talking reading a verse or a chapter. I'm talking immerse yourself in God's Word. You can immerse yourself in a game. You can immerse yourself in a TV show for hours. Have you immersed yourself in the word? Because there, that is how the, the Holy Spirit speaks to us. How many times have you been looking for wisdom and, and you get into the word and you, and you read the word and it's almost like the Lord gives you the answer right then and there. Or even if you seek wise counsel and you go to someone and they give you what God, God's word has clearly laid out. So, when we look at it, we do have it far better than they did in the Old Testament because God dwells within you if you're a believer and he has given us his word. And as we take the word, he communicates. He speaks to us every single day. And he gave a message to Jonah. He says, arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up against me. Which leads me to my second point. What was so bad about Nineveh? I mean, why is, why is God so cranky about them? If you look at a map, the Assyrian Empire is in the, in the bright green, and they were a mighty, dominant nation in the Middle East from roughly the 9th century to the 7th century. They, had, uh, they were in what is now uh, Iraq and Syria and Jordan and, and Lebanon, the capital city was Nineveh, and it was one of the greatest cities of ancient times. And yet, they were, they were wicked people. They were evil. I talked to Dr. Mayhew this week, because there's not a lot in the, in the Bible of stuff that talks about them before Jonah. And, and he shared with, through archaeological digs that basically, the Assyrians were known as the, the Nazis of the ancient Near East. They were wicked people. I, I read uh, one thing where they would capture, they would take the people that they capture and they would take the leaders and they would skin them alive. I mean, they're just wicked, wicked people. We look at what groups like ISIS does and we look at that and we just say, that's, that's wicked. How can you do that? How can you, in front of TV, cut someone's head off? It's just not right. It's, it's just, it is indeed wicked. And when you read after Jonah of of different prophecies that the scriptures have in Isaiah chapter 10 and in uh, 2 Kings 19, 
which are on the heels of Jonah, you, you just see the evil. And yet, look at how God is gracious. They are a wicked, evil country. And God is sending Jonah to go and warn them. How gracious of God to do that. How good of him to do that. Now, I do want to stop here and kind of do a little parenthesis. We, we look at Assyria, we look at a nation like that and say, man, those guys are bad. But have you ever wondered what God would say to America? I mean, you, you think about this. Last, last week I was, or, or I read a, a, an article by Franklin Graham last week, and he was talking about America is living in dark days morally and spiritually. The sin-sickened state of America will have a far greater consequence than a financial cliff. And it's true. And, I, and I, I don't want to be a hater because I know people say, hey, I'm just visiting church and I want you to make me feel good. But here's the reality of what is going on in our country. People mock God. They ignore God. People in general, we're talking Christians, those that call themselves Christians and those that don't. Surveys show that there is very little difference in how we live. There is pride. There is worry. There is grumbling. There is abortion. There is gossip. The whole concept of premarital sex is, is consumed, considered normal today. People are unthankful. They are selfish. Gay marriage is going to become the law of the land soon. There's a lack of self-control in every area. America is an extremely overweight country. And the list goes on and on. And, and I don't say that to be a hater. I say that to say God is very, very, very patient with our country. And we should pray for our leaders. But we should not look at a group like ISIS and look at some of those other groups, look at someone like Russia and, and what's going on over there and say, they're the evil empire and we're the good empire. We, before an infinitely holy God, just like the Ninevites have spat in God's face and did, so, so do we here in this country. And it says in Acts 17, 31, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Jesus came the first time to be the substitute, to be sin for us. He died for your sins. And there's going to come a time in the future where he will come and he will judge this world. And judge this nation. And in Christ, he has, he has removed our judgment. But he calls us to be lights in a dark world. Now, back to Jonah. He says, go. Go to them. Arise. Go to the great city, Nineveh, and call out against them. The distance between roughly Joppa and Nineveh would be about a month journey if you are traveling 15 to 20 miles a day on foot. And he says, I want you to go to them because their wickedness has come up against me. And so what is Jonah's response, which leads us to the third point? Jonah flees from the presence of the Lord. He just, he just leaves. Verse 3 says, Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Instead of that short little journey that he had where, where God says, okay, I want you to go up to Nineveh. Instead, he goes the opposite direction. And the distance between where he was and where he was supposed to go was 2,694 miles. And you know what? 
Jonah doesn't argue with God. Jonah gets up and says, oh, you want me to, you want me to go here? He doesn't, doesn't have this conversation. He just gets up and he, and he goes. He flees from the presence of the Lord. I thought about that. It's like, what kind of conversation went on in his head? Do I do it? Do I don't? Seems like that answer was pretty quick. And he had the Lord speaking to him, and he said, nope, I'm going to do what I want to do. Which leads us to the fourth point. There is always a price to pay when you flee God's presence. Always. It says he paid the price. He paid the fare. He paid money to get onto a boat. And money wasn't the cost. I, I sat in my office this week and I said, I could have done the whole message on this point. Young people, if you're here, I'm begging you to listen to me. When you ignore what God has clearly said, you're going to pay a price. You're, there, is gonna, there, are, there is a price to pay when you flee from God's presence. There are always consequences. There are unintended consequences that will happen. You could talk to anyone who is under 30 years old and talk to them about, how did that work out when you, fleed, when you fled from the presence of the Lord? And they will tell you, it did not. It did not work well. And they could show you the scars of their lives. And there's some of the people in this room right now that, that are still dealing with scars, not only from their own rebellion, but from the rebellion that have, others have had that impacted them. You will pay. You will pay with regret. You will pay with a lack of peace. You, you, you will pay. Jonah did not get on that boat. He was not singing worship songs to the Lord. I can guarantee that. Anytime I interact with people, and one of the joys, one of the great gifts this church has given me personally is Pastor Jason gets to preach every other week. So I have the privilege of getting into many of your lives and many of your family's lives. And, and I'm telling you, when people flee from the presence of the Lord, they are miserable. They might not know it. They, they may think that they're fun because there is a pleasure of sin for a short time, the scripture says. But you go down that road and there is no real, lasting, God-honoring joy or happiness or intimacy with the Lord. The scripture says in Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, he will also reap. And you need to know that God is holy and good and perfect and just, and he is for you, but he is for you on his terms. And, and we look at God and we say, mm, I don't want to do what he says. And when we choose to do that, there are, there are, always, there are always consequences. There are. I... I've been praying for is that some of you that are currently right now, you're, you're rebelling, you're running, you're fleeing from the presence of the Lord. Oh, you might not be doing anything in your eyes big. See, here's this, we have this mentality that there are little sins and there's big sins. The whole venial sins and the mortal sins. And, and can I just tell you, before an infinitely holy God, God sin is sin is sin. The sin of worry is rebellion. Because we're not trusting the God of the universe. And you say, well, I'm not going and cutting somebody's head off. True. And the consequences are less. But there are still consequences. Anytime we know what to do and we don't do it, there's always a price to pay. And you know what ends up happening? Hurting people hurt people. This is what I have seen and I see over and over and over again. When people are hurt, they hurt other people. Sometimes you're the recipient and sometimes you're the one that's dishing it out. 
And so just if you, if you get nothing else out of that, evaluate your life to say, where am I fleeing? Because there, there's going to be consequences. You're going to pay one way or another. There's the fifth point that I want us to see. Why did Jonah flee? And then there's a one-word answer, rebellion. Jonah did what Jonah wanted to do when he wanted to do it. God spoke to him directly and said, I want you to go. He didn't go. Now, we're going to see when we get to chapter 4, he's going to say, well, I knew God was compassionate. I knew he was gracious. But ultimately, he did what he wanted to do. Because he wanted to do it. And he didn't care what God said. He only cared for what he said. And when, whenever we disobey. This is something you have to understand. Whenever you disobey. I don't, I don't care if you're grumbling, if you're complaining. That is rebellion. And we, oh, we try to justify it. Man, we try to justify it. We, we are experts at justifying our rebellion before an infinitely holy God. And so, there is grace for the rebel. And that rebel is us. I want us to look at some, uh, I want to look at five points of, of application to help you battle rebellion. I was looking through a biblical counseling article, and, and these things just made perfect sense for what goes on. Because we are. I mean, part of this is you gotta, you got to realize, you're a rebel. You say, oh, well, look at me. I'm, I'm good. I'm at church. I don't do anything wrong. You know, c- compared to the person that next to you, yeah, you look, you look fine. You look great. But God knows your heart, sees the motives. He sees what's going on in your lives. And when we we know to do something and we don't, we're, we're rebelling. And if we're honest, we do it every day. So how do we battle this? Number one, you have to embrace a correct view of God. This is so huge. There is a God and you're not it. And the God we worship and serve is infinitely good and holy and just. He is sovereign. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He knows what you did last night. He knows what you're thinking. Before you stand up or sit down, he knows every thought that's in your mind. He knows everything. He knows how you spend your money. He knows where your eyes go. He knows what you're thinking about other people. He knows everything. You can, you can look good to everyone else in the world. But God knows what's going on in your heart. And I would just say when you have a, a big view of who he is, embrace it. Because that will help you. There's nothing greater than spending time adoring, worshiping this massive God that loves you and is very good to us. One of the things we do on Wednesday night, and I invite you here Wednesday, 6.30. Many of you were serving in the Iwana programs and in the youth program. Walk in where the offices are. You go to the left. We spend time praying, but we, we go through the Acts model of adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And the, my favorite time of the week is being with my brothers and sisters and worshiping the Lord, adoring him, reading scripture about who he is and how good he is. Because when you do that, when you do that for a, a lengthy period of time, those big problems you have get very, very small. Why? Because you get your eyes on a correct view of who God is. Some of you are going through hard circumstances. The God of the universe loves you and is working in those. And he says he will work it for good for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. And so th- this is a start. This is a good way to battle your rebellion. Embrace a correct view of God. You're not God. Which leads to the second point. Revise your false beliefs. When when I hear people say, I feel, I think. If it is not run through the grid of scripture, it's usually not good. I've had people justify and rationalize all kinds of sins. Leaving their spouse and doing doing whatever they want because, well, you don't understand. God knows and, and I feel and I think. No. 
You have, you have to check that. You have to revise those things. I, I often say um, there, there, is, there is this false belief that is out there that you are a victim. The victim mentality is all over America. And as a victim, you deserve this or that. And can I just humbly say, yeah, a lot of you have been hurt. A lot of you have been wronged. I get it. There, there have been a lot of bad things that have come your way. But if you're here as a believer and you have this big view of God, God is using those things to help you grow and to make you into the man and the woman of God that he wants you to be. The goal of your life, we looked at this two weeks ago, is not your happiness. The goal of your life and my life, if you are a Christian, is Christ-likeness, period. Not your comfort, not your ease, not your security, none of that stuff. Then none of that stuff matters. And so he calls us to him and he calls us to have to, to revise our false beliefs. Because most of the things that, that bounce through our head, if we run them through the, the screen of Scripture, and they, they don't make it through. Which leads us to the third step. Repent of our sins. Repent of your sins. We, we have to do this daily, daily, daily. That is why it is important to be in the Word, and the Holy Spirit takes it, and He convicts us. We, and, and we buy into this mentality, it's okay for me to worry. It's okay for me to fret. It's okay for me to, because I look at most of you, I know most of you. You're not doing big things wrong. There was someone who robbed the bank down here at, uh, on Mack Avenue. I, I looked at the picture. I, didn't, I don't think it was any of you. I just, you know, just, that's good news. I'm happy to see that. So you're not, you're not bumping off banks, but... Where are you crabbing at your wife? Where are you have an attitude about someone at work that is, that is not right? Where do you have something where you haven't forgiven somebody? And, and let the Lord convict you, and, and he will do that and turn. The, the biblical understanding of repentance is you're going this way, you turn and you say, God, help me, and you go in the other direction, and you keep going in that other direction. And if need be, you get accountability to stay on the right path. Do you, do you realize every one of us here struggles? We all do. And, and usually it's with the little things that become big things. Number four, listen to God and not yourself. It, it's a repetitive thing, but I'm telling you, it's, it is true. You need to take in the word and saturate yourself in the word not just a verse, not just a chapter. I am amazed, I am amazed in my own life how I can spend a lot of time watching games, doing entertaining things. And, and none of those things are bad. But if I spend, oh, 15, 20 minutes, you know, in, in the Word, soaking it in. And so there needs to be a real a real battle there. I, I know the more I'm in the word, the less rebellious I am. And when I'm not in the word, man, am I rebellious. And I don't think I'm any different than anyone else. And the last one is this. Flee temptation. Choose obedience. And that's on the little things. Take practical steps to say, you know, we, we always say to our young people, Resist temptation, flee it. I am, I am almost less concerned with the younger generation, though I'm still concerned. I'm, I'm concerned for all of us because no one gets a pass on this. And there are, there are new sets of temptations that come your way as you get older. And they're, they're all different, but they're, in one sense, they're all the same because the temptation is to put you at the center and not Christ at the center. And so we, we all need to choose obedience in how we, how, may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be pleasing in his sight. See, Jonah was a rebel and there was grace for him. 
guess what? I am a rebel and there's grace for me. And you are a rebel and there's grace for you as well. I want us to now make this intensely practical in in your life because I'm going to ask you right now, bow your heads, close your eyes, and I want you just to talk to the Lord for a good while here and ask him to expose where you are being rebellious to an infinitely holy God. Ask him to reveal that to you. Lord, your word says that rebellion is as the sin of divination. And though we would never consider consulting a demon and being involved in the occult and doing evil things in reality when we Ignore your clear promptings and your clear word. It is, it is rebellion. And Lord, you have laid upon our hearts something. And I just pray that right now we would take that and with the, just a slight raising of the hand, say, Lord, I give it to you. I don't want to do that anymore. Forgive me. I turn from it. Lord, I want to have a big view of who you are. I do want to revise my false beliefs. I want to listen to you and not myself. And I do want to flee and I want to obey. Father, do your work in our lives. Help us not to look and think about someone else. This is between us and you, Lord. Change us. Give us joy in you. Father, there's some that need to change some habits. They need to get some accountability. They need to go talk to someone and ask for forgiveness. They need to change their pattern of entertainment, how they spend their time, their talent, their treasure. Lord, you know You know where rebellion is deeply rooted. And Lord, only you can pull that out. And I pray that you would for your glory. And Lord, as we obey you, there is joy, there is happiness, there is freedom. So Lord, do your work, I pray, in all of our lives. And we will give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand, I want to conclude with a, with a passage. In Philippians chapter 4, because I do think a lot of this is, is we have a massive thinking problem. We, we think in ways that we shouldn't. In Philippians chapter 4, Verse 8, it says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if anything is excellent, if anything is is worthy of praise, think about such things. Whatever you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, put into practice 
and the God of peace will be with you. And all God's people said, amen.